Welcome everyone for technical session number four, getting into motherboards. So the past few days, we've kind of gone over some very basic stuff with regards to the role of a professional in the industry. We started to get to know what computers were in, in very general terms. And then yesterday we took a tour through the computer and talked about some of the major components you would see. And now we're gonna be doing a deeper dive into each of those components. So we'll be going over motherboards, later we'll go over RAM, then we'll go over CPUs, we'll go over drives. You know, every one of those things will have their own technical session associated with them so we can have a better understanding of what these components do. Throughout the course of this particular objective, we are going to explain the key role of a motherboard, what it is, what it does, what is its purpose, be able to describe and identify the components and typical interfaces found on a motherboard. Loosely speaking, we're going to be looking at a motherboard like a map, get to understand its general geography, all the pieces on that motherboard, how to identify it, and over time it will become second nature when you look at a circuit board, you're like, okay, this is what that is, this is what that is, and it will become very, very familiar to you. Three, identify required maintenance checks for a motherboard. Four, we're gonna name the steps to installing a motherboard and using BIOS to configure a, mother a motherboard. We're gonna identify common pitfalls when installing, common problems that come up with motherboards, including overheating and power problems, as well as start to describe how to solve some common problems that come up with motherboards. For this particular technical session, big things we wanna keep in mind, adaptability, you know, that's a big part of why we're here. We're trying to adapt, adapt to the current environment in which we are and make ourselves a little more bulletproof in our careers so that we can continue to progress. Also, we need to maintain persistence. Some of this stuff is not gonna come easy. Some of this stuff is gonna be almost a fight to learn, but we want to maintain our persistence, keep pushing through, keep trying, asking for help, working with our classmates, maintain persistence. And even when you get into the work field, persistence is a great thing because as an IT professional, you're kind of like, you know, a detective in many ways. You're trying to root out what those common problems are, find ways to fix them. Sometimes there will be a predetermined path for you. Sometimes it will be something completely new and you need to keep going until you've found that resolution. Sometimes it may be out of your skill set and you have to hand it off to a higher tier for them to see if they can handle it. Here's a little you know, thing you can do to set yourself apart. Maintain persistence. If you had a problem you did not know how to solve, follow up with the tech who you handed it off with, ask them what they did. Show that persistence, because if you can now figure out what they did and add that skill to your toolbox, you have now increased your value to the team. Every tool you have in your toolbox, every problem you know how to solve increases your value to your team. So what is a motherboard? Well, motherboard, also known as a MOBO. Again, outside of this, I've never heard anybody call it that, but you know, so they say, I guess it's what those young kids are using today with regards to terminology, but um, you know, MOBO is a alternate term that they can use. Uh, provides essentially the foundation for the PC since it connects directly or indirectly all the pieces of hardware that are attached to that computer. It's kind of like the backbone or even the nervous system of the computer itself. It is a multi-layered circuit board containing copper paths called traces. Those traces carry signals and voltages across the board. And some layers can carry data for input and output, while other layers will distribute power from the power supply. And the interface to configure the motherboard is called the BIOS. Does anybody remember what that stood for? 
uh, the basic, basic input, 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 input output. 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 There we go. Basic input output. And output. Got almost all of them. What's the S? There you go. System. So yeah. BIOS, basic in well, everybody was like basic input output. input output. But system. There we go. System. So basic input output system, BIOS. <clears throat> so we also need to be able to understand motherboard form factors. What exactly is a form factor? That is just a really fancy way of saying size and shape. You'll hear that term form factor used a lot in IT. And again, it just means size and shape. So all motherboards come in a relatively <laughs> rectangular or square shape, but vary in their overall size. And this will directly correlate to its layout and the built-in components, how much expansion capabilities does it have, all that stuff, because it's all about real estate. It's location, and it's about how much real estate you have. So the form factor applies to the case you're gonna be using. So you gotta make sure the case you have is compatible with the form factor you're going to install because not all motherboards fit in all cases. And the power supply you're going to need can also be determined by your motherboard as well as the components that you're going to be installing. And this defines how the air is going to move around the case as well. The three most popular form factors that you're going to see, there's also a wonderful picture of this in your book, uh, where it kind of lays them all out next to each other. You have the ATX, the micro ATX, and the ITX. ITX itself is not a specific form factor, but it is a family of types of form factors, which encompasses the mini, the nano, the pico, and the mobile. So that gets down into... Uh, tablets, phones, things like that, when you start getting down into those other smaller boards. Mike, questions so far? All right. Uh, Mr. Kelly? Yes. What does uh, the ATX, ITX mean? Like, does that stand for anything? Um, I don't know exactly uh, okay. what they stand for. I, can't said, um, I got it, Advanced, I got it, Kelly. Advanced yeah. technology. Advanced technology. Advanced technology. Advanced technology extended. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was in a chapter Micro. last night for motherboards. Okay. I just couldn't remember that one off the top of my head. <laughs> Thank you. The dictionary is only so good. Thank you, everyone. So... Advanced technology extended, there we go. And then uh, there are motherboard form factors above this. Like there is one bigger than the ATX, uh, popular by gamers, um, but that one is not really brought up in the 1001. So. All right. So here is the... Uh, essentially quick pictures of them and then kind of measurements of what each one is. So like the ATX is 12 by 9.6, micro 9.6 by 9.6. So the 12 is just a little bit bigger than a piece of paper. Uh, micro ATX, you know, is more squarish. And then the mini is your 6.7 by 6.7. Do I need to know those measurements? Yes and no, it's kind of, you know, it's a kind of, now, if you're looking at measurements and you see that it is more of a rectangular shape, you know that's an ATX. It's more square and a little, you know, almost the size of like one edge of a piece of paper. That's some, you know, your micro, and then your mini is, you know, gets smaller than that. So I mean, you can use little tricks to help you remember it. Typically, when you get below the ATX, they tend to be more squarish. ATX itself tends to be more rectangular because they offer more expansion uh, ports. All right. So what's going to determine what kind of motherboard are you going to use? 
Well, it depends. This is kind of a chicken and egg scenario. Are you starting with your motherboard or do you already have a bunch of other stuff and you need to replace a motherboard? So if you have a bunch of other stuff already and you're trying to replace a motherboard, then you need to understand what type of case you're using. You need to know the power supply you're using, type, of number, type and number of slots you're gonna need uh, to use your peripherals that you have, what type of CPU socket you're using. Is it, you know, an LGA or a PGA? Type and number of memory modules you want to be able to add. The speed of memory and, and CPU, because that can be hindered by the bus speed of your motherboard. Types of chipsets that they have and compatibility for plug and play, otherwise known as plug and pray. What's right. the question? Sorry, I didn't ask a question. Uh -huh. um, LGA and PGA is for the types of chips. Ebony, we'll get into that when we talk about CPUs. That stands for land grid array and pin grid array. Those are two different types of form factors for CPU chips. All right. So expansion slots and sockets. So here's a good representation here of an LGA, which is what kind of chip? Got a 50-50 shot. Intel. Intel, Yuki, and who else spoke? Uh, oh. Me, Melody. Melody, thank you, Melody. So yeah, Intel, it's got that Langer array. The bottom of the chip is smooth. So all the connectors on it are flat. And then you look at the socket right here and you see a bunch of little pins sticking up out of the socket. So that lets you know the style of chip that you're going to be installing. Then you have your RAM slots. They're gonna be single or double inline memory modules. It's gonna depend. Granted, you don't see many single inline memory modules nowadays. So, most of them are double, probably mostly generation three or four at this point. But we will talk about that when we get into RAM this afternoon. And remember, they always had these little tabs on either side of them to help lock the RAM modules in and help you remove the RAM modules as well. So we briefly mentioned this yesterday, PCI or peripheral component interconnect. So the first ones that we came across, the first PCI bus had a 32-bit data path, which is essentially how much data it could push through at each pulse. It supplied roughly five volts of power to an adapter card and operated roughly at 33 megahertz. Version two, doubled that capacity. You got 64 bit, 64 bit um, data path. And then the power consumption actually went down 3.3 volts PCI slot, doubling the data throughput and lowering the amount of power required. So because a card can be damaged if it installed in the wrong voltage slot, they install notches in each generation, which we will, we will show that here in a little bit. And the same works true for RAM. Uh, so that will distinguish between a five volt and a 3.3 volt slot. So they anticipated this could possibly be a problem and designed a way to try to help prevent it. So if you're trying to install a component and it rocks back and forth because it won't sit in there properly, it means there's probably a notch preventing it from seating. And it may mean that you have the wrong generation uh, expansion card you're trying to install. So the conventional PCI or the original PCI is no longer evolving at all. And uh, ended up with four types of slots. Essentially you have a by one, by four, by eight, and I believe by 16. But we'll show those here in a little bit. And the original PCI can achieve bandwidths up to 133, 266, or 532 megabit, megabytes per second, excuse me, big B, bytes 
megabytes per second. Will they get this technical with you on PCI slots? Not really, but it's important to understand the evolution of it. AMD is a type of processor. So the two main players in the central processing game currently is Intel and AMD. So here's kind of a top-down view of a PCI slot. Remember, for the majority of the time, when you look at them on a motherboard, they are cream in color, typically. Then based on where that slot is, so see the three volt is up here, five volt is down here. So there's no way you could mistakenly put, you know, one in the other because it wouldn't be able to seat down into the slot because that notch would prevent it from being installed. All right. Let me get to PCI X, which is peripheral component interconnect extended. This one typically offered a high speed alternative to the PCI, it uses the 64 bit, uh, bit data path, <clears throat> and has basically gone through up to three major revisions. This typically was seen in the server market, not necessarily in the personal computer market. All right, then you have the mini PCI, which is a laptop expansion card. It offers up a very small, like significantly smaller version of the PCI slots. And they're essentially using laptops, all-in-one computers, and they tend to work with small form factor motherboards. And they're designed as when you install them, like you install them straight down into the slot and then they will lay over and lay flat so that they can work in very tight spaces like you would on a all-in-one or a laptop. So you don't have a whole lot of real estate on those devices. All right. Mostly, what they're trying to represent here, this is the AGP, which we talked about yesterday, which is the accelerated graphics port. It is typically a brownish color on your motherboard. This is that bridging technology between the old PCI, which are these cream colored ones, and the PCIe's, which we will get into here in a bit, which are the um, more advanced versions of the PCI slots much faster, um, can handle a lot more throughput. <clears throat> so the original ones, video only, or it was a video only version of the PCI. It was typically used for graphics cards. And unlike the PCI, which went through the South Bridge, which you'll understand what we're talking about when we say that here in a little bit, which has a slower connection to the CPU, the AGP was connected directly to the North Bridge, which is a much faster connection. And again, you can see with each revision, they have a little notch that sticks up and that notch is in different locations depending on the generation and type so that there is no confusion and you're not able to install one in the wrong generation type slot. All right, expansion slots and sockets. So we have the PCIe, which is the peripheral connect inter peripheral component interconnect express. So much faster than earlier iterations. I will get with you in just one second, Daniel. Um, it is an extremely high speed alternative to the old PCI and even the old the advanced graphics or accelerated graphics port as well. It utilizes the serial bus, which is significantly faster than a parallel bus. And then it comes in four different slot sizes. We have the 
PCIe by one, by four, by eight, and by 16. You'll be able to note those based on the size of the, of the slot. We will show that when we get a look at a top-down view of a motherboard. Yes, Danielle. We have to um like remember the exact notches for each one, or is it kind of like riot? Wonderful question. The answer is no, you don't. Uh -huh. You just need to understand that those notches are there for a reason. That's why they're there. It's so that it's each generation the slots in a different location, so that you you know don't install them in the wrong place. Off the top of your head, no, you don't need to know that for the exam. <clears throat> and um. You know, in the wild or, the re you know, when you're working in the industry, over time, you'll kind of get to know, like, you'll pick up a RAM module. You know, if you're only working with two different types, like Gen 3 or Gen 4, you'll put, you'll pick one up and look at it and be like, yeah, it's a 3 or that's a 4 just based on the notch. You know, just looking at it quickly. But that's just because you're handling them all the time. So it'll become a second nature thing where you just kind of see it and you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Stephanie had a question about whether you could buy the cards and stuff. Do you want to explain that? Oh, if you can buy expansion cards and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. You can get them on yeah. Amazon. You can get them at, you know, Best Buy, you know, computer stores. My personal favorite is Fry's, even though we don't have one here in uh, Jacksonville. The last time I was around one was in Indianapolis. But they were pretty awesome with their computer components. <clears throat> so. Yeah, she's saying uh, what cards. So, um the, the things that Kelly was, talk, was talking about, we call them cards, even though they're components, because they slide in into certain spots. Yeah, they kind of look like a card. And then right. you, you dock them down into a, a slot. Micro center. Okay. So most commonly, though, the PCIEs are used for um, video cards, graphics cards, things like that. That's the primary use for them. This fun little chart down here, do I have to memorize that? No. You know, but again, in looking at it, you know, over time, it should make more sense to you, the information it's providing you. So. All right, here is a look at some of the expansion slots right here if you can see them right here is your pcie by one you can see it's extremely short and then you have the really long ones right here and these are the pcie by 16s <clears throat> and then you have the old pci right here and then over here you got one that's about half as big as the 16 that's a by four or it's about excuse me it's about a third as big that's a by four, PCIe by four. So you can see a by one is short, by 16 is really long, and then they have other ones kind of in between. Yes, Kevin. Um, yeah, like, especially like reading last night and everything, I'm, I'm very confused upon the, uh, like, everything to do with like the bits and the bytes and everything and like how it, how it like, um, travels and converts and stuff like that like all, all that all that like it was just like i i understand some of it but like it's it's uh just a little confusing to me okay are you talking about like the speed at which uh the information is traveling through or are you talking about yeah how like like especially ones like and zeros into actual letters numbers and pictures yeah that the, the they was talking about that in the in the in the, in the textbook it was like um like talking about how the how the uh um how the, oh wait ne never mind i'm sorry i'm sorry that's that's when we were that's when they were talking about ram not not the uh, pci slots i'm sorry okay and we will we will talk about that and and the easiest way to kind of associate the ram with the the generations and the speeds is by using music you know like okay. whole notes half notes quarter notes and it makes it a little more makes a little more sense as to how the pulses are coming through Okay. So, but we'll we'll talk about that when we get to RAM. Yeah, sorry about that. I got confused with my parts. <laughs> no worries. All right. So chipsets. Fancy way of saying what kind of chip they use. So every motherboard has its chipsets, which has one or more integrated circuit chips that support the CPU. 
interfacing with all other devices. These chipsets that you have installed must be compatible with the processor it's serving. Remember we talked about yesterday how um, you can do a build on a computer with a motherboard and a chip and it says technically it goes together, but you need an update for it to be able to go together. This is kind of what they're talking about. So out of the box, this chipset may be incompatible with the CPU you want to use, but you can use an older CPU, push an upgrade over to the motherboard, and then it is now compatible. <clears throat> So the most common set of chips that we're going to be talking about is, you know, the North Bridge and the South Bridge. Much like real estate in the real world, on a motherboard, it's location, location, location. North Bridge connects high speed interfaces. So all the things that need really fast connections come through the North Bridge. So that's going to be your CPU, your RAM, your video cards, all that stuff passes right through the North Bridge. And it is located closest to the CPU. It's one of the easiest ways to identify it. It is the largest chipset. Remember, we said that large heat sink that you see close to the CPU, that's almost always your North Bridge. That's what we were speaking of. Then you have the South Bridge, which connects your lower speed devices. This is going to be your external connectors. This is going to be like your external hard drives, USBs, um, expansion devices, the BIOS itself, because the BIOS doesn't operate really quickly. Your keyboard, your mouse, you're like, oh, don't we need really quick feedback on our keyboard? I don't care how fast you type, you are not going to overwhelm the South Bridge. I mean, we're talking milliseconds out of the North Bridge. So they are embedded within the motherboard themselves. They have their own heat sinks installed on them. And then the two major chipset manufacturers, when you're talking about CPUs, as we've mentioned before, that is your Intel, which is the LGA, and then you have AMD, which is your PGA. Currently, those are our two big manufacturers. We potentially have a third rising, but we'll see how what the quality is like and cost and all that kind of fun stuff over the next few years. All right. So here's kind of a logical map of what you're looking at inside of a computer. This is a wonderful grant, uh, diagram to get a screenshot of. Because this kind of shows you where everything passes through. So you have your, your CPU, which is doing all of your computational processes. And then immediately close to it, you have your North Bridge. Connected to your North Bridge is gonna be your graphics card because we want no lag in our graphics that needs to have an extremely fast connection to the CPU, hence coming through the North Bridge. The memory slots, essentially the RAM, as we learned yesterday when we saw that little short video, RAM is the short-term memory for the CPU, it holds pieces of information that the CPU itself cannot hold on to while it's trying to make computations. So it will push things into RAM if it can't hold it in its own memory and then pull upon it as it needs. And it needs to have an extremely fast connection in order to do that. Then we get to the slower connection stuff. You get your South Bridge. That's when you start looking at your PCI bus. That's the old school cream colored uh, slots on your motherboard. That's going to be your, your NIC cards. That's going to be your um, audio cards, stuff like that. Radio tuners, various things of that nature for you know, the older technologies. And then you have your onboard graphics controller, which would be the graphics card that, was, that comes with your motherboard, which is typically what the majority of us use. It's your standard graphics. <clears throat> that is also connected to it. And then this connects to what's called your super IO, which is your input output. And that is your, you know, your serial bus, your parallel ports, your floppy disks, keyboards, mouse, all that kind of fun stuff goes through the super IO into the South bridge and then connects on into the CPU. And then you have your hard drives, ethernet, audio, 
sea moss, all that stuff comes to the south bridge as well. Now up here, you also see a little chip off to the side. It's called a clock generator. Because we don't want data collisions or things not able to communicate at the same speed, it's kind of like a metronome. If you've you know, ever done music, where they have a little thing that kind of keeps time, or it's like tick, 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 tick. The clock generator does that for the computer. It creates an internal clock where all the pulses of information will be based off of that clock. And it may surprise you that the clock is essentially a quartz crystal that they install. It's just a little piece of quartz. And amazingly, why they use it, it's the same reason why they use it in wristwatches. For years, quartz was used in wristwatches because they knew if they put an electrical current through a quartz crystal, it vibrates at a predictable and consistent manner. So you can base time off of it. It's called the physoelectric effect. You don't need to know that. That's just kind of, you know, something that's there. But they use a quartz crystal in order to set the time for the entire motherboard and then is eventually used for the whole computer. Because you can't have one thing talking really, really, really fast and another thing talking extremely slow. They wouldn't be able to communicate very well. So you have to set the time or set the tempo that everything will talk. Correct, Kevin, like a normal quartz clock. So nowadays, more so now than when this was developed, um, in order to make things more and more efficient, we start integrating it into the circuitry. We do this over time, where we used to have to install a NIC card in every single computer uh, that we got. Now, NIC cards are already installed on the motherboard. They've been integrated into the motherboard itself, and it's already just a piece of the circuitry at this point. It's not a later upgrade you have to do. Because it is now integrated into the circuitry, there is no bottleneck in communication. It's able to communicate a lot faster. And over time, we start integrating things more into the boards, and then the boards more into the chipsets. And so we're now starting to incorporate things into the CPU itself. And most recently, like within the last five years or so, it's become more common that the CPU itself is absorbing the North Bridge. So the North Bridge is now being incorporated into the CPU chip that you install on the motherboard. And then with that, the South Bridge is able to essentially move closer and have faster connections and is almost becoming kind of like a North Bridge, but not really but it's still, it's able to increase its connection speeds and all that kind of stuff. Questions so far? What is NIC card, sir? NIC means network interface card. That is what you use to talk to the network, the internet. Thank you, sir. Is NIC on the exam? Yes, repeatedly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you mean knowing the integration of moving things into the North Bridge and incorporating it, Yuki? Um, not so much on the exam, but it's just something that is kind of happening over time. It's kind of the evolution of the industry. Will they specifically ask you about it? I haven't seen a question about it. Interface, not internet. But that is a way you can remember it. So network internet card, if you wish, but it is network interface card. It is a card used for interacting with the internet or the network. So we talked about this a little bit. Clock generator itself is this quartz crystal encapsulated in this little piece, um, soldered directly onto the motherboard generates a frequency essentially in megahertz and where one megahertz equals essentially a million cycles per second. BIOS or the basic input output services or system. 
It essentially serves three purposes. It essentially provides data and instructions code essentially so that the CPU can communicate and manage devices such as your keyboard, mouse, hard drive, memory monitor, anything that's hooked up to it. The BIOS is what is telling the CPU how you can, how do you talk to these things? So it's essentially setting the standard for how things can communicate. Once you start it up, the BIOS itself is what is performing your post test. It's going through just running a series of checks on certain things. Is everything hooked up right? Can I talk to everything? You know, are we all good? If we're good, okay, move on to the next step, which the next step is what are the settings? <clears throat> you know, like what time it is right now, you know, so date, time, ports, and then especially important boot order. Where does it go to look for the operating system? We have to tell it to do that. So where am I gonna look for the operating system that I'm gonna run when I start the computer? If you don't have anything on there, you boot straight into BIOS because it doesn't know what to do and you have to configure it and set it up. But you could sit there and tell it, hey, this is the order in which you will look for things when you're looking for an operating system. You may set it up to where it's going to look to the optical drive first, the DVD-ROM. If there's nothing in the DVD-ROM, after that, it's going to go looking at the USB ports. If there's nothing in the USB ports, okay, you're going to go look at hard drive one. If there's nothing on hard drive one, you could possibly set it up to go over the internet and look at a specific server for the operating system you use. A lot of organizations actually use that as their number one. When it, and they use what are called thin clients. When the computers turn on, those, they basically only have a BIOS on there. The BIOS tells it, hey, we want you to go looking you know, at this server. That is where your operating system is. And it goes and it boots from a remote server. So that is your boot order. All this is done in the BIOS. And as it is volatile memory where the settings are stored, if they lose power, all your settings get wiped out, which is why they keep that little watch battery that we talked about yesterday, that CMOS battery is installed on the motherboard. It provides just a little trickle of power, enough so that the, the settings that you have put into your BIOS all remain there. They don't get erased, which leads you to a nice troubleshooting scenario if ever you boot up your computer and it says unable, you know, date and time not or unknown. That means your CMOS battery died. So you gotta go in and just replace the CMOS battery. So it's a simple way if you ever see that error instantly, that should guide you right to your CMOS. Yeah, the computer says 1900. Uh, but also it's a way if somebody puts security measures in place to try to keep you, like if you have an employee and they put a BIOS password on so that you cannot boot up the computer to get any information. Um, if you wanted to bypass something like that, you remove the CMOS battery, erases the settings, so the BIOS security is removed. You install the battery back in again, and now you move past that BIOS password which is also why most places put padlocks on their computers, because if you can get inside it, you can get past that security measure. So we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but that is the main purpose of that battery itself. So here's what it looks like. It's like just a little watch battery, it sits in there and uh, you can just pop it out, put another one back in if you wish. The other way you can do it, I don't know if they have it on this picture, something called a jumper pin next to the, um, the RAM where you like pull a pin out and you push it down in and it does a reset on the CMOSs or on the BIOS as well. So, all right, BIOS, unfortunately, is a, a legacy technology and legacy is just a really, really fancy way of saying old. And um, it is being replaced as we speak because it is unable to handle uh, modern systems. It can't handle any 
drives larger than 2.2 terabytes. And we basically have shot way past that at this point. So we need something a little more robust. And Mr. So, Curry, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry before you go for that. Uh, are you seeing the, um, the CMOS battery? Um, when you take it out from the motherboard, it's not going to affect the time. And the no, it does affect the, the time. System. It does so affect now, the time. System. It resets all of that stuff. Okay, fine. Now tell me, what is the difference between the CMOS battery and the BIOS? The CMOS battery provides power to the BIOS because the BIOS settings are stored on volatile memory. Volatile memory is erased whenever it loses power. So the CMOS battery gives a trickle of power to the BIOS the firmware chip, allowing it to maintain the settings even if the computer is turned off or unplugged. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. No problem. <clears throat> so, we, you know, being that BIOS had its limitations, we had to find something to replace it. They designed the UEFI or Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. Most computer systems nowadays operate off of the UEFI. Nice thing about the UEFI, it uses what's called a GUI interface, which is graphic user interface, which is what we have become comfortable working on. You have a mouse you can use, a little pointer, you can click on stuff and it's pretty, you know, pretty user friendly to get around. Old school BIOS, real easy to point out. We'll give you pictures of both side by side where the only way you're moving around on a BIOS screen is by the arrow keys and using enter and that's about it. So it's very, very archaic looking system versus UEFI, which is, you know, has a lot of fun bells and whistles, a lot more things you can do with it, <clears throat> stuff like that. Also, the UEFI can support either a 32-bit chip architecture or a 64-bit um, chip architecture upon booting. And then we just talked about the graphical interface to configure your CMOS and settings. Questions? Well, I have one on the chat. I, I think I answered it, but I don't want to take a look at it. Real quick. Well, the BIOS itself is the, is the instructions for the computer, but the BIOS has memory in it that saves your settings. So it saves your date and time, where to go looking for stuff, how does it talk to the hard drives, the monitors, all that stuff, the settings by which you have put in there, that is stored on the CMOS. And then the battery provides power to the CMOS so that it doesn't lose those settings. Does that make more sense? I'm getting some blank stares, so like thumbs up. Am I making it worse? Are we overwhelmed, underwhelmed, whelmed. All right. All right. So here is a picture of the UEFI. Nice and pretty. It's got, you know, you can give it kind of a, you know, the aesthetics that you want. You want it to have like a bluish color or red, you know, whatever color configurations you want. It has <clears throat> a nice little temperature monitors in here where you can see your, you know, the, the temp of your, your chipsets. You can set fan speeds. You can put in all kinds of fun little, um, settings in here to do things at specific times like alienware will have like a silent mode where it'll kill all your fans like if you're doing a presentation like i'm doing right now so you don't have all the fans coming on and making it really loud and kind of annoying if you're talking on a conference call you can have silent mode where it will kill all the fans or they'll run really slow so they don't make a lot of noise so you won't <clears throat> bother yourself in meetings or bother other people in the meetings and stuff like that. So these are types of things you can set up within the UEFI. Also overclocking, you could do that in the old BIOS, but it's a lot easier to do in UEFI and overclocking. All that means is you're making the, <clears throat> the CPU chip run faster than is recommended, but you can intentionally force it to do that. 
And there are some benefits and downfalls to doing that kind of stuff. All right. Some of the basic connectors you'll see on your motherboards, and you will come across these on a pretty regular basis. So up here, you've got different types of fan connectors. You see two pin, three pin, four pin. Uh, up here, the most common you'll see is the three and the four. And a question you'll hear come up all the time is, what do I do if I have a four pin connector here, but only three pins on my motherboard? What do I do? And the answer is you just plug it in anyways. Because what it is, is that's the power button and then the on and off switch for the, uh, the fan. The fourth pin is just fan speed. So the only thing that changes is instead of your fan being able to adjust how fast it's turning, it's basically all the way on or all the way off. The only difference. So there is no adapter. You don't need to go out and buy another motherboard. You just plug it in and it still works. It's just not as, uh, doesn't have as many bells and whistles essentially. So that's on fan connectors. Then you have your Molex connector here, which is kind of a, co a common one. Here is your main power supply. It's a pretty big plug on any motherboard. And it's typically um, notated as a, 20 plus four. And you can kind of make that out based on how it looks and what it is. They have 24 of them put together. And sometimes that four pin connector can disconnect from that connection and then plug in to be your CPU power. Uh, but this is also called the P1 connector or your power one connection. Uh, down here, right here, this is called an IDE or PATA connector, P-A-T-A. -A. So this is usually used for older hard drives, old floppy drives, things like that. The, um, the cable that comes out of this is flat like a ribbon. We'll show you a picture of it, but it's very, very flat. It's not like a round little tiny cable. It's broad, wide, like a big fat ribbon that comes out. So it's kind of easy to identify. So you may hear it called an IDE connector, a PATA connector, P-A-T-A, or a floppy drive connector. Over here, you can kind of see it's supposed to be SATA. Um, you have little banks that'll look like this. They have kind of like L-shaped connections. And these would be your SATA connectors. Typically the wires on your SATAs are red round cables. These are usually used for more modern hard drives, solid states or more modern mechanical drives. And then you have your USB connectors. These are the old school USB 2.0s on the motherboard. They are notated. Let me see if I can erase what I just did real quick. Might be hard to see, but if you look right here on the motherboard, it's upside down, but you can see USB 2 written on the motherboard. So remember, if you look down on the motherboard, you see all this, you know, there's like tons of writing on this motherboard. It tells you what everything is. And also right here, you can see that L shape that I was talking about. So that's a SATA connector right here. You can see it right here. It's kind of an L shape connection. And that is for a SATA. Make sense? Questions? I know this one's got a lot of information, but trust me, through exposure, through time, 
you do remember it. Yes, Greg. Uh, you mentioned the power supply um, piece right there, uh, the 20 plus four. Mm -hmm. And you you said something about the, the, the four can be disconnected and plugged in for CPU power. I yep. didn't understand that part. Oh. Well, what it is, is, is like, I'll show you when we, when they show the actual connector, wire connector, I will explain mm -hmm. that a little better. It's just, it's one of those things like they can, they only can make so many different types. Like you have a bunch of different kinds of motherboards, but like, you know, they don't want to make 50 different P1 connectors. So they make adapt like pieces that can kind of break apart, but I'll show you what one looks like here in a little bit. So you can see it kind of disconnects and then the other piece will plug in somewhere else. Okay. All right, thank you. So, mm -hmm. It's like early iterations of motherboards, the CPU received power from the main power supply, but as CPUs became more powerful, they needed their own more direct power supply. So then sometimes they would limit this to a 20 and they would take four pins and then they would connect it to the CPU power, but we'll show that a little bit. I always see it, but I just didn't know what that, you know, why is it like, look, you can break it off almost. Yes. So mm -hmm. I'll show you a picture of one and it'll make a little more sense. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's like two, two connectors that are just joined together. together yeah. And then you can either use them as one piece or, <coughs> excuse me, or separate them out. <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. I couldn't get to mute fast enough. Oh, I tried. But yeah, we'll show that one here in a little bit. All right, input output interfaces. We briefly talked about this yesterday when we were looking at the motherboard uh, for the internal parts of the computer. You had the USB 2.0s, which are these banks right here. They're identified as USBs with black connectors internally. You have USB 3.0s, which have the exact same shape, but they are this light blue color. So that is a quick way to identify just upon looking at it, the difference between a generation two and a generation three. You can plug in a generation three into a generation two and it may still work fine. It just, it's likely not gonna receive power and the throughput's not gonna be as fast. You can put a generation two into a generation three and it will work just fine as well. You're just not getting full use out of the technology that you have. Um, then you have the display port. It's kind of, you know, we have, you know, we're going to go over a whole session that's nothing but cables and connectors. But the display port is kind of flat on one side, if you see it right here, and then it goes over. And then the other side almost looks like an HDMI where it has that angled piece. So we'll, again, we'll talk about that stuff a little bit later as well. You have your HDMI port, which if, you know, hooked up a TV or something like that. You're pretty familiar with what that is. And then we have an older school DVI port. This is a DVI I. And uh, this was the replacement for the VGA cable, which is like a blue DB15. You'll know what that is here in a little bit. We'll show you like when we get to cables and connectors. So these are your display ports. You have your internet connector right here, for your RJ45. And then as we talked about, you have your audio hookups here, and then you have the SP diff, which is fiber audio as well for that real crisp, crisp sound for the, your audio files out there. Did you have another question, Greg, or are you just kind of hanging out like that? Uh, I'm great. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, my hand's up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just making sure. Just making sure. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to pause it right here. Okay. Now that we're back. So here is kind of our first real top down view of a motherboard. Do we need to be familiar with the geography of a motherboard? Absolutely. Are we gonna get lots of opportunities to work on the geography of the motherboard and learn more about it? Yes. Absolutely. So work our way around the board. 
We have our 20 pin connector, which is our main power supply right here. We have our RAM banks, which are kind of easily identified with these little tabs they have on either side where we put our RAM modules. Here are those IDE connectors that we were talking about where you could uh, put in floppy drives, stuff like that. And they're either identified as IDE, PATA, or floppy drive connectors, depending on what information you're looking at. There's this big heat sink that's close to our CPU socket. So biggest heat sink next to that. We know that's identified as our north bridge with the heat sink sitting on top of it. Then we have this brownish connector right here. This is our AGP. And then our PCI slots right here. There is no PCIe on this one. They have that cream color. Our south bridge is kind of lonely over here in the background. Coming around the front, we can identify that watch battery right here, that round flat battery, CMOS back, backup battery right there. And then we have our exterior connections, our audio, ethernet, USB, firewire. Uh, there is a, seri or a modem connection right there, keyboard and mouse, printer. We have our CPU sockets and then the fan as well, which is like the little, like three little pins that stick up out of the uh, motherboard. So, because we want to be mean, we're going to go around and pick some lovely people. Get us started. Slight hint, cameras are off. My eyes are drawn. I got to go to the camera ops first. That's where I go. So, <laughs> works every time. <laughs> um, we still got a couple here. So, um, Jamari, can you please tell me? what A is as far as a connector on the board right here. What is this, A? Jamari, you there? All right. Other thing that happens is if your camera's off and I'm calling on you and you're not there. I heard you. No, I'm not. I wasn't calling you, Doris. Oh. <laughs> I'm saying if the camera's off and I call on you and you're not there, then we go to the waiting room until you log back in so that I know you're there then. Because when you log back in, it gives me a ding and lets me know you're there. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay, I'm glad. Because... That's part of us being here. So Doris, can you give us what A is real quick? All right. I've seen that. If you're struggling, please feel free to phone a friend. Well, no, because we, I think we do way. allow that. I was just, I was just hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. No, no, I'm saying you, if, if you get, if it, you know, it takes a minute, you're like, I just, I just, I don't have it right now. Please feel free to phone a friend. Phone a friend? Oh, you mean ask somebody else? Yes. You can okay. uh, call out, call on yes, one of your socket. classmates. Motherboard. Is that a what? Socket. That is a socket on the motherboard, but it, you know, it does have a I specific name. ID. Power supply. No, not, not the power supply. Okay. We're up here, number A. So A, you see the green line coming to this, this cream colored connector right here? PCI slots. PCI, who, who was that? Was that Emily? Yeah. That is absolutely correct, ma'am. Let me write that down. <laughs> so PCI, right there. Very good. So right next to that we have B, Bravo right here. It's a little shorter cream colored piece right here. 
Let's go with Ding. Could you please tell us what we got here? Uh, PCI slot. Okay, that is a PCI slot. There's a little bit more to it. If you want to take a guess, is look. So this is a PCI slot right here. Pretty big. This is a littler one. So what would the we say on the graphics card? It's not well, not a graphics card. It's a PCI. Not PCI PCIe 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 extension. Well, it's a PCI. E? Yeah, I buy one. Buy one. Buy one. Remember the remember the, the length of it? You know, this is like right here. This is a buy 16. And then the little real short one, that's a buy one. So it's a PCI buy one. So, but we're getting close on them. And that's what we're wanting to see right about now is just kind of getting close. Obviously, you know, it's progress, not perfection. So, um, see. so Kelly, yes, who's you said B was a PCI by one, yes, PCI by one, like a PCI okay. X one, yes, correct. Okay, okay, got you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you download the Nearpod for today, you'll have this wonderful map to practice on as you go if you wish to get more practice working with it. All right, C. Kelly, I have a C. question real quick. If okay. that's PCI by one, right? What's the regular PCI? By 16. 16, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we got here. Greg, can you give us C please, or Charlie? Express or PCI Express. PCIE or PCI Express, also a by 16. Excellent. Let's see, Stephanie, could you possibly give us a D right here? Remember, don't, you know, don't. Be worried about getting it wrong. This is part of why we're here. You're also muted, so I can't hear you if you're talking. Sorry about that. No uh, worries. Is that the chipset? No. Not the chipset. I like to guess, though. It's not a chipset. So right here, you see there's like these little four little holes. These four little holes look kind of similar to these, right? Uh-huh. So what this is, because I know we haven't pointed it out on the previous map, this is going to be the power supply for the CPU because it's closest to it. Okay. So remember we were talking, uh, Greg, about that 20 plus four, where we said we would have the 20 yeah. and then the four pin would disconnect and connect somewhere else. Here's where that yeah. four pin connection goes. You say the power supply for the CPU? Power supply for the CPU. Or you could just, you know, quick and easy, just CPU power. And it is a four pin connection. You can see it here, one, two, three, four. Hey, Mr. Kelly. Yes. Which one was that? That was D as in Delta right here so uh my question is if the power supply is d what is g that's also a power supply uh pin too, well right? d is the power supply to the cpu oh, only okay. okay so it only is providing power to the cpu you got you so Thanks is it like is it still a power connector yes it is still a power connector Okay, because that's what I was about to say, but I, I put that on there, so that's why. Yeah, it, is, it absolutely is a power connector, but it is the CPU power. All right, Ella, can you please give me E as an echo right here, E. Big square thing right here.
I'm not sure, but uh, that's not a fan, right? It's not a fan, although when it is put together, you may see a big fan on top of it. Is that the main power connector? It's not the main power connector, but you know, I like, I like what we're guessing here. Is Think about this as the, the brain. Who, who, who's speaking? Memory who's slot. Did you just say CPU, right? DPU, the central processing unit. But this right here, if we look closely, if you notice, there is no chip there, right? Is Memory slot. So it is the CPU socket. Stop. Oh. This is where we would put the CPU. And um, Ella was correct. You know, you would typically see a fan here because you'd put the CPU socket, then you'd put your heat sink, and then your fan on top of that, right? So when you look at it, when you first open it up, you would see just a big fan right there. So E, that would be our CPU socket. All righty, D, can you please tell us what F is? F as in Foxtrot, these yellow and red things right here. Three things still loading. F is in Foxtrot, these yellow and red things right here. Can I take Oscar's answer and say memory slot? <laughs> yes. Is that the DDR memory slot? Yeah, this is where the RAM memory modules would go right here, the RAM slots. You remember, you see these little tabs on the side right here? Kind of lets you know right away that those yep. are RAM modules right here. So F is RAM modules? Yep, memory slots or RAM, RAM slots, however you want to put them, pronounce it. So very good. F is memory slots. Very good. All right. Danielle, since you got your hand up, what is G? <laughs> I don't even know how my hand got there. G is. I hear G. Dang, you just said it. Power supply. Power supply. Who just spoke? Rebecca. Sorry. Rebecca. Wonderful. I didn't know I was my speaker was. <laughs> so power yeah. supply. So and, D, uh, D is a power supply, but G is just a power supply to somewhere else. G is the P1, which is the main power supply for the entire board. So you may hear it called the P1 power supply. You might also hear it called a 20 plus four connector, which is your main power supply, but this supplies power for the entire motherboard. Whereas D is in Delta, just supplies power to the CPU itself. And when you see the actual connector, it's gonna be one of the biggest connectors, it probably is the biggest connector. It's very easy to, to Yeah, it's see. pretty close. Yeah, between that and the tight and the theta, right? The floppy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You are correct. So let's see here, Oscar, can you give us H right here? I know it's a little hard to see, but it looks floppy just disc. like this one. Floppy disk connector. Floppy disk connector, very good. What's another word name for that? Uh, FDD. Pata. Is that Pata. a disk floppy connector? Pata. 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 Floppy, IDE. Those are the, basically the names for the same thing. Are these the same <clears throat> with the disk drive connector or? Yes, essentially, you know, FDD, I mean, for floppy disk drive. This is that big fat ribbon. We'll, we'll see what it looks like here in a little bit. Or I think we might have a slide port and cables and connectors. But thank you, Oscar. So yeah, this is a floppy drive or IDE or PADA connector. See here. 
JR, can you please give me I? It's an igloo or indigo. I, so it is a little hard to see, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, give, give us your best guess. Give us your best guess. Give us your best guess. Come on. Um, Got four little pins sticking up. So it's a four pin connector. <laughs> Technically, yes. Okay. But more specifically, what would we, what might we use it for? This one happens to be a four pin. I might see a three pin one. Is it for the fan? A fan connector? It absolutely is for the fan. Oh, wow. That's good job. Exactly good job, Jerry. Good good job. Job. Thank you. <laughs> you said, oh, wow. <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, that is your fan connector right there. There's a few of them throughout the, um, throughout the motherboard, you know, because they connect. You hook up your case fans, all that stuff to this as well. So, nice work. All right. Vaughn. Can you please tell me what J is right Data? here? J is in Jericho. What was yeah, that? Sata. Sata, is that what you said? Yeah, Sata, yeah. S-A-T-A. That yes, that absolutely is Sata. That is your Sata bank right there. It has those little L-shaped L connectors in there if you see them, like a little L-shape. Very good. All right. Bernard, please tell me what K is. Green thing right here. I ain't gonna lie, you got me on that one. <laughs> uh, Give us a I guess. I know this is the first time y'all are seeing this, so we're not expecting perfection. I'm going to say the ID. And I'm going to say you're absolutely correct. Nice work, sir. It's the IDE or PATA connector. Sir, I have a question. What is H then? What is what? H. IDA H. connector. H. Uh-huh. IDE. Uh, you have two ID connectors. Well, one here is for floppy drives. You know, the other one may be for a hard drives. So you might have um, one for like the 3.5 inch floppy disks. And the other one might be for your actual mechanical hard drives. This is an older motherboard, so. I, I, uh, what you're trying to get to is they're the same type of connector, right? They're both IDE connectors. Yeah, they're both the same. Sorry. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Mm, motherboard is not that bad. The only thing that's missing Too is missing is AGP, right? Yeah, it doesn't have an AGP in it. Yeah. What else? PJ. Can you repeat J, please? J is the SATA connectors. S A T A. SATA connectors. Sir, I'm, I'm not clear with the ID connectors. Could you please explain one more time? So ID connectors, there's two of them. H and K are ID mm -hmm. connectors or PATA, P-A-T-A. -A, Papa, Alpha, Tango, Alpha. Um, and they can be used for like the old little plastic, uh, was it three and a quarter inch? floppy disks that you would use to, you know, put documents and stuff on back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, or it could be used for old mechanical hard drives, older mechanical hard drives and stuff like that can use it as well. And they just have the connectors on it are these pretty wide connection. And then the cables are going to be very, very fat, thin, like a ribbon, not thin and round like a normal cable but we will show that in a little bit, what they look like. Still, we, we will have the floppy connectors still in the new, new, clap, uh, new computers? 
some do, it? some don't. It depends on your motherboard. So it's one of those things like if you have a floppy drive and you wish to continue to have one, you can uh, look for this connector or you might be able to find more recent floppies that'll have like a USB connector and you can go about it that way. Okay, sir. Okay. Ooh. So if we have a floppy drive, then we will be having this connector. That's what you are meaning, right? If your motherboard supports floppy drives, then yes. your motherboard then, will have it. Okay, yeah. sir. Okay. Thank you. All right, we only got three left. Let's see here. Yuki, can you tell me what L is? L as in Larry, right here. System panel connectors. <clears throat> yes, that is your front panel connectors, how you connect the motherboard to the case that you put it in. Hey, so Kelly, uh, sorry, everybody wants to try one when you get a chance. Okay. So if you can have the next one, I guess. <clears throat> Excellent. So front panel connectors, L, again, this is how you connect the case that you put the motherboard into the actual motherboard. So when you press the power button on the front of your computer, it actually knows what you're trying to tell it to do. So that would be L from panel connectors. So M as in Michael, Ebony, can you please tell us what M is right here? This little yellow square. We'll give it a, give it a guess. Give her a second, she's gonna type it. No worries. Serial port, good guess. It's a good guess. Um, but this one um, happens to be our, yes, D, excellent. That is our USB 2.0 connectors for the USB. So this would be the ones that would hook up to the front panel of your computer. The ones that would be externally on the back would come out of these connectors right here. All right. What's that on the mark one? Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just curious. Yeah. Um, in the same line, Above that, uh, after you skip that um, IDE, the white one on top, what is that? Up here? Is that another? Yeah, that, that one right here. Uh, that, I believe, that might be USB 3.0. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. If I, make, if I uh, remember correctly, I have been known to be wrong before, but based off this, I think it is USB 3.0. Okay, thanks. All right. Let's see here, last one. Chevy, can you tell us what in as in Nancy is? Okay. Um, in. Little round thing right here. It is, um, it's a battery, <laughs> right? I, I would agree with you, yes. Yes, that is a battery. <laughs> um, The backup battery? Yes. I don't know what it's called. You are, you are absolutely knocking on the right door. So, yes. You had, um, some, uh, you had, you had some friends help oh, you. Oh, well, yeah, I see. C, whatever. How do you say that? CMOS. CMOS. CMOS okay. battery. Very good. Um, and just real quick, I don't know if it's called headquarters, but it is a USB port or connector. Um, so A, B, and C, uh, D, A is your older PCI, um, connector. B is a, what's called a PCI by one. So it looks like PCI X one. That would be B as in Bravo. C as in Charlie is your PCI E, which is PCI express. So nice work, everyone. Um, Mr. Kelly? 
Yes. What What is the ACAT uh, used for? Like, what does it stand for? The what? The SAT, SAT. Oh, SATA? SATA, yeah. Yeah, SATA, that's usually for more modern hard drives, like your solid state drives, um, optical drives, DVD, Blu-ray, things like that are typically connected through SATA connections. Did you say um, I one more time? I think I might have gotten I, I mixed up with something. I is a case fan connector. Okay, all right, thank four, you. It's a four pin case fan. How about Stephanie? What was F? What was F, guys? F? Foxtrot. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. Memory slots. Don't worry. You'll get plenty of practice on this. In fact, if you download the Nearpod student paste, you'll have this where you can practice on your own if you wish. I do encourage it because you may see something that looks exactly like this on the 1001. Um, they're gonna Kelly, yes. very, very similar, very similar. Would you mind if it's not a lot, just, just go into all, all of them real quick, just A, what it is, B, C. Like, I know we'll see it again, just you know, sure. if you don't mind. Absolutely. Oh, where is it? I didn't have it. <laughs> so real quick, A, PCI connector right here. PCI, cream, cream colored, bold connector B, PCI by one. C, long blue one here is your PCI Express. D is in Delta, that is your CPU power supply. E, as we do not see a chip in here, this is a CPU socket. F, this is our memory slots right here. G is our P1 power supply, which supplies power for the entire motherboard. H and K are IDE or floppy drive or PADA connectors, however they you know, choose to call them at that point. G is the P, as in Papa, P1 power supply. It's your primary power supply for your motherboard. I is your four pin fan connector. J is your SATA bank. It's for hard drives, optical drives, things of that nature. L is your front panel connectors to attach the motherboard to the case fan or to the case so that they can communicate. M is your USB connectors. And N is in Nancy is your CMOS battery right here. Thank you. No problem. And Hold on. We have a fun little matching game. Pause the recording. Here we go. Here we go. So, <clears throat> maintenance on a motherboard <coughs> in general. <clears throat> we mentioned some of this yesterday. Sorry, let me take a little. Quick sip of a drink real quick, it's my throat. Sorry about that. 
So some maintenance checks that you need to do on a regular basis with regards to motherboards. So biannually, you know, like every two years or so, you need to ex you clean your expansion cards, expansion cards and motherboard. So you need to make sure sometimes depending on the environment the computer is in, you may need to do this a lot more frequently. You need to be keeping the PC free of dust. So when you open the case, likely you're gonna blow it out or you can use a mini PC vacuum. Do not use a regular vacuum. They are not meant for this kind of work and will likely damage the computer because PC vacuums have special attachments on them. So where they will not produce electrostatic discharge. Normal vacuums do not have that. So the likelihood of damage is extremely high if you're using a regular vacuum. Compressed air is typically what most people would use to clean it out. Hey, Mr. Kelly. Yes. Hey, um, I have one of those uh, shop packs and the side panel of mine comes off, but it blows air out. But would that hurt it? Is it too much, you think? I, depending on the severity, yeah, that could be pretty good. I know somebody who used a leaf blower to blow out a computer. So, you know, like, do I advise that? No, but compressed air is usually works pretty good. <clears throat> the thing is you don't want to introduce more dust and debris into the computer, you know, is the main thing you want to be careful of. And the level of dust and debris you get can vary drastically. If somebody owns, has pets, like cats are the worst. Um, they love to find warm places to hang out, particularly behind computers. They shed a lot. That hair gets sucked into the computer and doesn't go out. And I have personally seen computer cases opened up and it looks like a pillow. So much hair is jammed into that computer. And the reason we opened it up is because it continually was overheating and it was overheating because no air could circulate because of all the pet hair. And we had to like scoop out handfuls of pet hair to get it clear. So, you know, this is why we do not keep towers on the floor. You keep them, you know, lifted up a little bit or on a desk. And if you have pets, you're gonna to have to open them up a little more frequently because of the amount of pet hair and dust in the air. All right, so we mentioned yesterday about chip creep. What that is, is over time, as you heat and cool items, they expand and contract. When you heat something up, it, it expands. When you cool it, it contracts, even if it's just a little bit. So when you have these two things in contact with each other, these little chips, set as they heat and cool hundreds of times over the course of a year, they start to drift apart and then they do not have as good of a connection as they normally would. So when you open up the computers, you know, you go through your RAM modules, your expansion cards and kind of just make sure everything is still seated properly. Connectors are still pushed on there good just because over time things get jostled, things move, you know, chip creep happens where things move. Um, so you just, if you're in there, you might as well do a quick check. Backing up the BIOS. It's always recommended to do this on a periodic basis, you know, from time to time. And then uh, checking for firmware upgrades. This is making sure your motherboard has the most recent versions of the BIOS for security and other, you know, reasons as well. And as we talked about, I think yesterday and last week, when you flash the BIOS, that is probably one of the riskiest moments for your PC, because if anything goes wrong during that time, the computer you are holding or dealing with becomes a giant paperweight. It is no longer functional. So yes, OSA, do not use power screwdrivers inside of a, inside of a computer. Or, or right. magnetic tools. Or magnetic tools. Thank you. Thank you. No magnetic, no magnets, no power uh, tools. All right. So trying to decide what kind of motherboard you want to use, you want to do a little bit of research. Make sure that if you're replacing the motherboard, that the motherboard is the, you know, the cause of your problem, for one. <clears throat> or if you're just doing an upgrade, make sure you do research that it is compatible with the components you have and the case you're using. More often than not, you likely will not be replacing motherboards because the, the time invested in, in swapping out a motherboard and the cost 
a lot of times it's just cheaper to buy a new PC, especially when you're talking about office PCs, like thin clients and stuff like that, where they're significantly less expensive than like a big gaming computer or something along those lines. So researching the type of the motherboard typically includes reading documentation, verifying the form factor or shape and size, checking the CPU socket and chipset to make sure that the power supply requirements you have already matches what is needed. <clears throat> and it's compatible with whatever chip you've purchased or already own. Determine the cost over features and buying from a reputable dealer, especially if you're buying for the company. Some companies will only deal with specific people with regards to buying any kind of equipment. Sometimes they will only purchase directly from the manufacturer. In cybersecurity, they call this a secure foundry. You do not buy secondhand parts because you don't know what's been done. So people can put nasty software you know, on some of these things and bypass your security if you're buying secondhand or refurbished. So they use what's called a secure foundry method to only purchase from specific re re uh, reputable dealers that have already been vetted or directly from the manufacturer themselves. You wanna make sure the motherboard you get has the number of bus slots and or other connectors and ports that fits the needs that you're trying to fill. You don't wanna go way over what you normally are gonna use, but you also wanna make sure you had at least what you need to function. Unfortunately for many of us, IT does not have an unlimited budget. You typically are operating on a very limited budget. So you need to be cautious about the things you're purchasing and don't, you know, don't gold plate things is what we say. So like if you need, you know, one or two bells and whistles, you don't buy something with a hundred, you know, because you're spending way more than you need to, you're getting functionality that's not even needed. And you're probably way overspending what you should for those items, which means you're going to have to cut back in other areas. So we don't gold plate things. We only do or get what we need to to perform the tasks uh, that we are assigned. So here are some of the steps to installing a motherboard. They may look familiar to what we did yesterday, any of them. So first, you want to you know confirm your right the right board or correct board has been selected, remove the components, then remove your old board, install the IO metal plate if there is one needed, mount the board in the tower, install the processor, CPU, CPU fan, all that fun stuff, install your RAM, attach all components. Once that's done, you can close it, attach your cables, switches, all that stuff. Install your PCI cards, attach your monitor, keyboard, all that fun stuff, and then turn it on and pray. So after this, we're going to go in and configure our BIOS. I know what you're thinking. You're all sitting there going, hey, is there like a lab or something we can do where we can practice working with the BIOS and all that fun stuff? You're absolutely in luck. Test out has labs where we can go in and practice working on the settings in the BIOS. So I know you guys might have been worried about that. So we got you covered. Multiple. So do multiple labs. <laughs> yes, multiple labs. So once you get, once you've turned it on for the first time, you're going to hit your uh, BIOS. You're going to be able to check your date and time. You're going to be able to disable abbreviated post if you wish. Set your boot order, ensure SATA is enabled, enabled to recognize the drives you have hooked up, save your configurations and exits so that you can boot into your operating system. After that, it'll do a full post check, verify no errors are present. If you're running a Windows system, it'll start verifying no errors are present, then it'll install motherboard, expansion cards, and all other drivers as needed. Reboot the system as needed to make sure adjustments in the operating system or BIOS. So basic settings for configuring BIOS. We will get into that in a little more detail as we go. And yes, there is live practice you can do in your simulators and test up. I think you may have some assigned for today. 
So here's some things that you can update in your BIOS settings. You can do the firmware upgrading, which is called flashing the BIOS, as we have mentioned before. Uh, component info information on your RAM and your CPU. You can check the, uh, the stats on that stuff as you go in here, make sure it's able to recognize it. It has a form of built-in diagnostics. And then here is some stuff you can configure, as we talked about, boot sequence, take time, clock speed, all that kind of fun stuff. And then on the other aspect of it, you can monitor stuff like your temperature, your fan speeds, your voltages, uh, your clock, intrusion detection. You know, has the case been opened? And your bus speed. All right. So you remember what the UEFI looked like? It was kind of fancy, had some pictures in there, some nice little graphic images. Well, this is what BIOS looks like. So very, very different, right? So I promise you, when you step into it immediately, without even seeing up at the top that it's a BIOS or UEFI, you will know what you are working with. And you, get to, you have BIOS that is extremely basic, which means you do not get to use your mouse. It's arrow keys only for navigation. And you can move through the various menus. Uh, lots of neat stuff you can do in here. Definitely worth looking around in. In the simulator, I don't recommend if you don't know what you're really changing, doing this on your own computer. So the test out simulators are pretty good for that. All right, so common pitfalls when installing your motherboard. Safety first. Always make sure we got that ESD bracelet or stand on an ESD mat in order to neutralize that charge between us and what we are working on so we can limit the possibility of electrostatic discharge. Typically, don't wear jewelry. If you have jewelry on your hands, you wanna wear ESD gloves over that, that's fine. Any dangling jewelry like bracelets or bangles or any kind of stuff like that, make sure you remove that before you work because they can create unintended connections between components, causing them to short out or be damaged. Make sure you tie back long hair, especially if it's low humidity. Um, you can get ESD through the hair as well, through your hair. And then always be sure when you are transporting a board, be it you know removing it or installing it or what have you, Hold the board from its edges. Do not hold the board from underneath because they have a bunch of solders on there. Those solders can be sharp and cut you. So in order to avoid that, just hold it by the edges. That's how it's meant to be carried. As we briefly mentioned in the previous slide, never use tools that are magnetized. You can damage chips with that. Take care when tightening screws. You know, this thing is not getting shot into space. We don't need to crank it down really hard. You know, it's just, it's like finger tight, quarter turn. That's about all you need. So. Also, be sure all screws are secured. You don't want some that are, you know, missing, rattling around in there. There's usually six to eight present when securing a motherboard and then never force a motherboard to fit into the input output slot, which is the back where your components would stick out. Uh, if it doesn't fit at all, it means you might have selected the wrong motherboard for the case that you have. Although they may have adapter plates to make it so that you can make it work. So you may need to do a little extra research. And also remember, it's not always a straight in and out when you're putting the motherboard in. Sometimes you have to kind of tilt and, you know, maneuver it to get it in, but we never ever bend the board because that can damage it pretty quickly. All right, some common issues that call centers tend to receive related to the motherboard, but mostly are related to the components attached to it. One could be an electrical or burning smell. So if you hear this, it's shut down immediately. If you smell or see smoke coming out of the computer, shut down immediately. 
uh, computer doesn't boot or you get those fun little beeps or post errors are heard that means maybe some components aren't secured properly other errors are present it means you have to look up those beeps see what they mean troubleshoot based on that although if you were just inside the computer messing with something like installing more ram it's highly likely that that's what the issue is If you cannot log in using a BIOS password, it means somebody before you went in and put a BIOS password in place. It means you may not be able to boot into the actual system. It means you need to likely pop the CMOS battery so that it will reset the BIOS settings and then you can get into the system after that. That does not bypass if somebody has a password or whatever for Windows and they're unable to get into that. This just gets you past the BIOS booting system. Buttons on the front panel are not working. Probably means your front panel connectors were not hooked up properly if you just put everything together. So you need to go in, check your schematics, recheck your front panel connectors. I know you're asking, do we have a lab where we deal with this? Yes, yes we do. Motherboard lights up, it won't power on. And then lastly, hardware not recognized by BIOS. So how do we solve common motherboard problems? Make sure your fans are clean and clear of dust and debris so that your system can properly cool itself. If you've recently installed components and your system is not working like it should and it's crashing, it could be that your power supply does not have enough power to run the components that you have installed. Sometimes we install incorrect components that are not compatible with the systems with which we are using. So we need to make sure that we verify this if we're having e issues. Post beeps, more often than not, make sure your RAM is seated properly if you've just opened the computer. That, that one is a really big one. Happens all the time. Components not inserted into the right ports or slots. And some case buttons are connected incorrectly with the front panel connectors. We talked about this. <coughs> Excuse me. Make sure you're verifying your hardware compatibility if it's not able to recognize uh, hard drives in the BIOS. And if you get a short circuit or a busted or swollen capacitor, your only recourse at that point is to replace the board. Remember the capacitors, those things look like batteries soldered down onto the board. You see one of those swollen up like a balloon or cracked and busted open, yeah, the board it's on is toast at that point, it needs to be replaced. You got here, oh, game time. Let's see here, uh, Carnival's new, let's go to Carnival. Should be able to log in here. Hey, we didn't have this. You what? We didn't have these avatars. I know, that's what I'm saying. This is all new. They did an update, apparently. I think you guys had the Halloween ones, right? Or was it Christmas? We had, the, we had the Christmas ones. Yeah. We didn't even have this. This wasn't even an option for us. So, yeah. We just, you, we just one of your boring quizzes. Your back in my day stories. I know. Back in my day, a year and a half ago. All right, looks like we got a bunch in here. It's kind of like a hoot. Ready to go. Wow, the music is terrible.
how should the motherboard be handled? I'm a fan of D, use a hazmat suit. by the edges. What can not be configured in the BIOS? Operating system version to tell us where to look for it, but not where you know what version we use. Hardware is not recognized by the BIOS, so most likely there is a short in the circuit board. True or false? which is not a part of motherboard maintenance. Oscar, Melody, Yuki. Nice work. Vaughn and Joyce are out the top five. All right. Now I know breaking all y'all's hearts. We're at the end of this technical session. We wanted more. But now we should be able to explain the key role of a motherboard. We should now also be able to describe and identify many of the components, a typical inter and in typical interfaces found on our motherboards. Identify required maintenance checks, steps to installing, which is very similar to what we talked about yesterday. Identify common pitfalls. Um, Common problems that come up with motherboards, including overheating and power issues, and then also begin to describe how we would solve some of these issues. Questions, comments, concerns? <laughs>